Welcome back to Painting Oswan, and in today's episode, we will be talking about painting black and also painting leather. Now, black can be one of the more challenging colors to paint, as you don't get to follow the normal process of shading and highlighting. On the other hand, leather is a breeze and can actually be one of the most fun elements to paint as you create texture and interesting shades to better reflect how leather actually looks in real life. So for the overlay color on the cur, I've used a purple and I chose purple because I wanted to create some richness and interest in the black and you'll see later on in the process I also incorporate browns and blues into the color as well. Let's get started. So we'll start off with the wet palette and here you can see I am mixing a darker color. So this is a combination of the Chimera Violet and the Chimera Black. There's a number of other colors on the palette as well which I'll come to a little bit later on when we start to use them. So the reason that black tends to be a challenge is that it breaks a lot of the normal rules. So with a normal color you have your shadow, you have your mid-tone, and then you have your highlight. Unfortunately, the mid-tone of black, when you think about it, is actually black. So you need to be creative in how you represent black in a miniature form. So rather than starting with a shadow and highlighting up, what we're actually doing is starting with the mid-tone, and then we're taking the shadows down all the way to black. So we're going to build up a few stages of shadows here to enhance the effect and the appearance of it looking like black. I find that it's very, very difficult to actually paint black to look like black. Invariably, it tends towards gray. So rather than try to fight that, I think the key is embracing the fact that you're more likely to be painting grey. And grey is a colour that has a lot of nuance. Grey, when you think about it, generally is just black and white mixed together, but you can also create much more interesting greys by mixing together complementary colours and by adding these other vari variations of colour into a black. So my approach to painting black is therefore to try to create as many interesting shades and nuances as we can, leaving the deepest recesses as black, and then having a lot of color introduced into it to help reinforce that there is a lot more happening than just black and white. Because as we all know, life is not black and white, and especially in the deep wood, it's shades of grey. I believe Jamie said we, we live in the grey. So you can see that starting with a purple base and then over painting with black, putting it into the recesses in the shadows, it's creating a, a look that feels like black but still has some interesting nuance. And we'll continue to refine this approach. We'll start with creating the shadows and then we will go on to painting the highlights in a fairly similar to normal fashion, but just understanding that those layers are important. So here you can see I'm mixing in a green. This is a color called pistachio. Now it's, it's almost a yellow, not a green. And you can see the very last thing I did there was grab a little spot of Chimera Violet and I mixed it into this color. Exactly what I talked about before, mixing together complementary colors will create a more interesting shade of gray. So this stage is more of a traditional highlighting stage and I will talk a little bit more about painting fabric in a future episode. But at this point in time, I'll just touch on a couple of key elements that again tie back into some of the things I talked about in the first episode, which is respecting the light and respecting the zenithal prime. 
So by having a consistent lighting approach for all of these figures, i.e. a top-down lighting, it means we get to be very straightforward in our approach towards where the highlights should be placed. This cloak is a beautiful sculpt, lots of interesting folds, but there's a shape to it that has a very clear area that should be hit with the light and then a, a section that should be hit with shadow. So now we're mixing in a little bit more yellow into this color rather than white. Again, this is, this is about creating more interesting grays as opposed to a black and white. You also tend to see that yellows mixed into black creates a warmer gray whereas white can create a colder gray. As these models are based in a forest environment, which is generally a pretty warm green color palette, you tend to see warmer colors on these figures that I've chosen rather than colder variations. There's a few exceptions, which is mostly just to talk about the cold and warm contrast. I haven't talked a lot about contrast yet in this series it's a word that has many and varied meanings i will go into that in a little more detail later on uh, just want you just want to draw your attention to again where these lights are being placed you can see i haven't highlighted anywhere near the bottom of the cloak i'm focusing on the raised edges i'm focusing on that upper portion and really trying to make this have a significant shift in value. So the deeper shadows are black, the lightest lights will be significantly lighter. I love adding little details on fabric, little scratches, little lines, unusual lines. Mostly this looks better on textured fabrics, cloth, that is supposed to be a little bit tattered, a little bit worn. It's this is just adds a little bit more visual interest. So the term contrast, it has a lot of application. When, when you usually hear the term contrast, most people refer to value contrast. So value contrast is the difference between light and dark. I talk a lot about a thing called the value scale, which is a scale of measuring how dark and how light a color is. In super simple terms, if you have a white, and we consider that white is the lightest color, we can plot that on the value scale as a 10, whereas black being the darkest color, we can plot that on the value scale at a zero. When we talk about contrast, what we're trying to achieve is a range on that scale within an individual volume. So we might have a shadow, such as on this cloak, where we start at zero, at black, at the darkest possible color. And then we may highlight that up through the value scale up to a four or a five. When you put something that is a four or a five next to something that's a nine or a 10, what you're doing then is creating a contrast, not just between your individual volume where it's got light and dark, but also between the low value area and the high value area. So here we're mixing another lighter color. And again, to just bring it back to what I was talking about, the value scale, this is probably a four. It's not a very bright color. It's starting to look bright on this figure but that's because it's compared to the darker shades, the zero, the one on the value scale. I don't normally break things down in my head in terms of I need to plot this, this color, this number, but it's just an interesting exercise to understand that sometimes you need to create areas of shadow next to areas of light to create visual interest. The dictionary definition of contrast is the juxtaposition of strikingly different elements. And I think that's a really useful 
fact to know because it helps inform exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to juxtapose light and dark in a, in a way that causes them to create visual interest. So as we move more into this yellow color, and as you saw before, we mixed in more ice yellow and more pistachio, this cloak does start to tend more towards gray. As I talked about in the first episode, my approach to any figure is to over contrast and sketch in all of my lights and then refine those colors and bring the overall value down. So we're gonna take this cloak to quite a high value finish and then we're gonna refine and smooth those blends and also lower the overall contrast. But you can really clearly see now how much I'm focusing on the upper areas with this and leaving those lower areas alone. That's again tying into the light, the zenithal prime and, and making sure that we're considering the light as our first consideration. So let's move into a pretty high value highlight and you can definitely see that it's tending more towards yellowy green than it is towards white. That's going to really trick a lot of people's brains into thinking that this is not going to look right. But again, what we're thinking about here is the environment. Every color on this figure, even though we can't see it, exists in a specific environment. For me, that environment is the forest. And so everything that I am adding to these colors is all about reinforcing that thought process that this is a warm environment, that there is green, there is yellow, and that's just going to help tie all of the figures together. I'm being a little more precise with these lights than I have been in the previous ones. And you can also see I'm again really leaning into the scratches, leaning into brush strokes and texture. It helps create something more interesting to look at rather than an ultra smooth cloak. It's also quicker, which again ties into the whole premise behind this series of painting your models quickly to look good on the table. And I think the rougher texture really ties into the whole story of the Oathsworn universe, which is that this is a pretty tough place. Nobody's shining and glistening with any anything new and perfect. Everything's worn, everything's a bit tattered, everything's a bit used. So these little micro details will create a second type of contrast that's different to value contrast and this is a pretty important topic and one of the main things I wanted to talk about in this episode is that contrast comes in a variety of forms so we generally hear contrast and we think value contrast but you can also have a contrast between temperature where you have a warm color alongside a cold color you can have a contrast between texture and then a textured area alongside a smooth area. Again, remember the definition, a juxtaposition of strikingly different elements. So having those two elements side by side, smooth skin or smooth fabric alongside texture is going to help create a more interesting model. Always good to remember the golden rule though, which is it doesn't matter what rules you've got, the rule of cool always supersedes it. So we're into the last lights now. So you can see we're mixing a little bit of the violet into the ice yellow. This creates a much more alive and interesting looking gray. As we move on to this last stage of highlighting, you can see I'm being much more precise one of the ways that you can help reinforce something looking like black is these last highlights being the only ones that really have a, a high value. So these last little lights very heavily focus towards the upper areas of the figure. 
again respecting the zenithal prime it's just a really easy way to approach lighting and miniature painting and i think when you understand zenithal lighting it allows you to consider volumes in a different way and that's when you can start expanding into different types of lighting one of the topics we'll cover in a future episode is actually object source lighting on which which is effectively lighting from the side or from a specific object rather than from above so these last lights really focused targeted towards these high high value areas and the little micro details all right so now we're going to move over to some airbrushing and you can see in the cup i've actually mixed up a quite light color i just wanted to use this color to soften the transitions by just using a little spray with the airbrush it's adding a little filtering to each of these areas and just losing a little bit of the roughness of texture it's not removing it completely but it's helping to unify this volume and make it look like it all exists in the same place once we've got that unifying approach we're then going to move into some shadows and again this is where we add more interest more nuance into the color so we've mixed in some contrast paints some black templar some pteridon turquoise some greens and we're just going to do successive layers over this area focusing on the lower half not really touching that raised area too much but just helping to add again interest change the way that you perceive this this color rather than it being a flat simple basic color we've got something that's a lot more interesting and this one we're adding pterodon turquoise which is which is a cold green which again i talked about earlier the contrast between warm and cold well we're actually leaning into that on this specific volume here we've got warm highlights with the yellow and we've got cold shadows with the cold green i think it's fun to experiment with temperature with texture as it creates a lot more fun of an experience when you're painting as well as a more rounded end result and that's the end of the painting black section that's the final result so leather it's a much different prospect to painting black we don't have to be as worried about shades and highlights we can just have a lot of fun so you can see there's a time skip here as i discussed in the very first episode often colors will change how they appear based on what's around them so i find it easiest to work on the whole model different sections at the same time so that you're getting a better picture of what the whole piece will look like when it's finished so i'm doing the leather areas in brown and that just helps get a better sense of how the black is going to look this is citadel's rhinox hide it's one of the most excellent browns i've come across it is rich and intense warm but also dark it's a very hard color to replicate it's probably the best brown that i've found so here we're just painting over each of these areas with the brown to start us off with a base coat. The approach that I have towards painting leather is a very straightforward one, but I believe it creates a fantastic end result. And we're going to follow a pretty traditional approach to miniature painting, which is starting with the darkest shadow and then highlighting up. So we're going to mix in some of this deep brown and we're going to add our first stage of a lighter color. 
Leather is such a fascinating surface to paint because in real life, leather has so much texture and so much variability. One of the things that I like most about leather is how it cracks often based on how it's used. And you'll see that's most evident on things like leather straps. When you have leather that generally only bends in one specific direction across the surface for straps, you tend to see a distressing of the leather that follows that shape. And so the way that I like to paint straps and leather is to consider how this object will actually be used in real life and how likely you are to see texture on it. If you think of leather belts and the way that leather belts are strapped around your waist, all of my leather belts have distress and, and lines that run from top to bottom, not sideways, not following the pattern of the belt, always perpendicular to the belt. And that's because that's the way that the belt is moved, which is what we need to reflect on this leather, which is obviously much more aged. So we are being very considered on each of these directions of these strokes. This is building up layers of texture that reinforce the shape that we're trying to create and also considering, as always, the zenith or light. So there's lots of little brush strokes on painting leather, which can, can be a challenge if you're not used to smaller brush strokes. But the best part about leather is you don't need to be really thoughtful about how you're placing your scratches. You don't need to be every single line in a perfect, precise position. What you need is the sense of texture, the sense of the leather shaped and distressed. So these boots are a fantastic example of looking at where the leather would be lit. So mostly focus these highlights from the top, but also how we're going to be catching texture on the straps and on the boots. To bring it back to my overall approach, sketch and then refine. So this is the sketch stage. We are simply establishing all of our volumes, establishing all of our lights and getting an idea of what we want the finished result to look like. This is the time to make changes. If you look at something and you think, yep, I don't like the position of this light or I don't like the position of this element of texture, this is a stage where you can just remove it. It's very straightforward. So as we're moving up through browns, the first color we used was the Citadel Rhinox Hide and this one's the AK Deep Brown. You'll again notice these colors tend more towards a warm color this is a very warm brown, again tying into the same stuff I talked about in the section on painting black, warm colors for the highlights. So for our next highlight layer, we're going to add some AK Sahara yellow. You can see this is a very yellow color, but if you compare it to the pistachio down on the bottom left, you'll see that it's not a green yellow, it's more of an orange yellow. This is going to help distinguish this leather color a little bit more from the ice yellow on the, on the black area. But it's again, just trying to keep a real sensation of warmth in this color. At this point, you can see that this process is really straightforward and really fun because you're not worrying about creating perfect shadows and perfect highlights. You're not worrying about the, the perfect 
angle of your brush. All you're thinking about is, is this in the right spot? Yep, cool. And then sketch away and have fun. It's a very relaxing, easy thing to do to just let your brush sing across the surface. As I said at the start, this is one of my favorite things to paint. And invariably, when I follow this sort of free approach, it comes out looking really good. So this Sahara Yellow, a mixture with Sahara Yellow and AKD Brown is creating the layers of highlighting, the warmth and all of the texture that we want this leather to have. Again, look at each specific area, the way that I'm highlighting the straps is different to the way that I'm highlighting the satchel, which is different to the way that I'm highlighting the boots. The direction of these brush strokes is very straight, whereas on the satchel, it's much more varied because the satchel is much more likely to get twisted and changed its position rather than these straps. So for our next highlight color, and again, this it's important to understand that what we're trying to do here is create a really high contrast change because what we're going to do in the last stage is glaze this down so that we have less contrast but a more unified look. So this is mixing in a little bit of Vallejo's Light Flesh, which is a pinkish color, but it's also quite high value, quite light. And so this is a little bit more precise we don't want the whole boot or the whole section to have this, this level of highlight. But again, we're looking for scratches, we're looking for texture, and we're looking for position and placement of the light. I think, depending on how much time you want to spend, you could eliminate some or most of these layers based on the last step that we're going to do. But I find that when you add this, this little bit more into these areas, that it really does bring the leather to life. I think it's just a nice, more realistic looking finish. So this satchel, the placement of the lights, again, really important to note how different that is to things like the straps. The straps are always up and down, whereas the boots, the brush stroke is more varied and the same with the satchel, but constantly Coming back to where is the direction of the light? How can we place our highlights to respect that? So this final highlight is using a mixture of AK Off-White in with some of the Vallejo Light Flesh. And this step is uh, described it in the first episode, the pop lights. So these are the ones that help your model stand out on the tabletop from a, from a distance. If you were looking at this figure under a normal painting lamp, a high quality painting lamp on your desk, or even a low quality painting lamp, this step would probably look like you've got too much contrast, too much contrast. It's not something you hear me say very often, I should add. But when you take it away from your painting table light and you put it on a table, all of a sudden this extra level of contrast is what will help your figure stand out on the, on the table. When you have a beautifully colored and rendered board that your models are about to play on, Sometimes your figures can get lost if you don't have enough contrast. By helping them really stand out, it will help 
your models pop on the table. So this step really is all about creating that extra level of pop and something to help them stand out on the table. At this point, I think you can, you can see how much all of those little micro scratches, all those little texture elements have added to the overall look. It's really easy to create this level of detail really quickly because as I said, it's not about precision of brushstroke, it's about overall position of highlights. The precision of your brushstroke is not even, not even something that really comes into the equation. All right, the last step, the most fun step, it's re-adding saturation. And once again, we pull out the contrast paints. And in this case, we're using Citadel's Snakebite Leather. And we're mixing in a little bit of medium to help it flow smoothly and not pull. All this does is creates a filter over the surface. It doesn't remove the highlights, it doesn't remove the scratches. What it's doing is it's filtering all of the colors and changing the lightest lights to be a little bit more saturated but also a little bit less light and it's also making your shadows a little bit more vibrant a little bit more alive so this layer is a dilute intense saturated color you don't need to use a citadel contrast paint a, uh, an ink will work perfectly fine. There's a lot of good chestnut inks that will have a similar effect. And all of a sudden your leather looks like a vibrant and textured and alive color. Really easy, makes your leather look great. I love this. Now what I also like to do is add more color. So I've added some green into the snakebite leather I'll give you five guesses as to why I've added green. And this green's helping to add a little bit more environmental color into the leather. It's subtle, doesn't need to be overpowering. And that's it. And that brings to a close this episode. In the next episode, we will be talking about painting white, which is the polar opposite of black and comes with its own challenges and learning how to paint stone. And for that, we'll be using the priest. I'm excited. I hope you are as well. We'll see you in the next episode. Big Dano.